Hello, um, and I'm Ariel Saber. Um, I teach uh, medieval Renaissance literature and Italian at Bowdoin College, and I'm here today with Guy Rafa, who teaches same uh, stuff and Dante and his legacy at UT Austin and has just published an incredible book called Dante's Bones, How a Poet Invented Italy, came out with Harvard University Press this year. And we're really excited to be here and talk about Paradise 28. Um, we wanted to thank uh, Alison Cornish uh, for organizing this Canto per Canto series, as well as Eugene, Eugenio Regini, Catherine Travers, and Maria Zillo of NYU. Uh, uh, in the list as well is Leonardo Chiarantini of University of Michigan, Christian Dupont of the Dante Society of America, Stefano Albertini, and Julian Sachs of the Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimo of NYU, and Awen, or Awen, not sure the pronunciation, films. We're <laughs> very grateful for this project, and we've loved watching other videos so far, and we look forward to doing this with you today. Great. Well, thank you, Ariel, and it's great to be here, especially with you. And, um, you know, one thing to say at the start is, you know, you and I, obviously, we've known one another for a long time, and we share a lot of common interests, uh, even besides Dante, but one of them overlapping is our longstanding uh, interests going back to our undergraduate educations uh, in science and technology, as well as literature and art. And obviously we bring that to bear on our work. Um, your wonderful book, <laughs> <laughs> Measured Words, um, a Computation and Writing in Renaissance Italy, obviously uh, gets at that theme in a very big way. And we're I think we're really lucky that the canto we get to talk about today, you chose it, uh, very, <laughs> very, uh, very appropriately uh, deals a lot with these kinds of uh, issues. And so the first thing I just want to say is how, we, how are we doing? Because we're obviously now in a very different uh, world than we were several months ago. You and I are, are big technology geeks to begin with, but obviously that's been really even put to the test more than we would have imagined uh, in our teaching this past spring. And whatnot. But one of the things to say before we start talking about Canto 28 and angels uh, is how you know Dante's angels are obviously intermediary uh, figures. Um, they sort of connect the spiritual, as you said, the spiritual and the, and the sensible or the uh, the physical universe. And in many ways, I mean, I've always thought when I teach this and I talk to students, I sometimes say jokingly, half jokingly, well, the angels are kind of like the I don't know the central processing unit, the CPU of a computer. They're the brains of the operation. And they're the intelligences, right? You know? They're the intelligences, right. And I think I think one of Dante's innovations is he's connecting the Aristotelian idea of the mover intelligences with the angels themselves, right? By assigning the angels uh, to the nine uh, physical uh, spheres. And so, you know, they are sort of the, the connecting uh, figures, you know, between uh, between God and, and obviously the spiritual world and the physical world. And, and in a way, I guess technology is doing that for us. You know, you and I are doing this right now remotely through Zoom in ways that wouldn't have been possible, wouldn't have been very possible what, to do very well, you know, just a few months ago. So I don't know how you feel. I mean, I, I'm both kind of, you know, daunted by it, but I'm also kind of excited by it. And Definitely. even in the teaching, there are some great things that have been happening, you know. In, in Definitely. Have Definitely. you had that experience? Yeah. Tell, Absolutely. Tell and I'm looking forward to teaching Dante, which I'll be doing in the fall, along with other authors in a medieval Renaissance course, and seeing uh, new ways in which students and, and I together will engage the text through different kinds of tools, uh, online tools and collaborative work. So that's kind of exciting. Yeah, and I think, you know, even with the students, obviously we miss seeing them, having them in the classroom, having those, uh, those in-person kinds of uh, connections. But, you know, there are things we do technologically that we can't do face-to-face -face and we can do sometimes better, uh, you know, having more time sometimes to, to look at their writing or having them do some, you know, discussion things and they have a little more time to reflect on it. Um, I know I was impressed with what my students accomplished even under a lot of pressure in the spring. So I'm actually off in the fall doing some more Dante research. So I have to wait another semester, but, uh, but I'm actually looking forward to sort of getting back, uh, back to it. So wh why don't you tell us a little bit about where we are, I guess a little bit about where we are here in terms of the transition of this, uh, this Canto 28. Yeah, this, this is uh, one of, there's many topics, of course, as always with every Canto, with every moment in Dante, but one of the things that strikes me, uh, strikes all of us when we are around 27, Paradise 27, 28, especially, is this transition between the material spheres and the Empyrean, the celestial realm that is outside of space and time. And in 27, uh, Beatrice actually has Dante turn and look back, look down, at where 
he's come from and look right. down at the aiwala, at the threshing floor, at the earth. And that's a fascinating moment. So he's looking back and now he again, he does it in 27, but he does so very intentionally in 28, looks forward, looks up, looks above. He is actually moving. He's being sucked into, in a way, the, mm. the centripetal force of the angels that bring everything towards God. Actually, that centrifugal, I should say, in the material realm, you're being pulled to the outermost sphere, whereas when you get to the angels around the God point, it's centrifugal. Everything's moving inward mm. towards the point. So we'll talk more about this, but it's an interesting moment of transition from yeah. material to immaterial realms. Right. And if I remember correctly from going back to 27 for a second, um, there was a lot of anger in that camp. Oh, yes. <laughs> that was the end of the period of Dante. Dante, just to tell our, our viewers where we are here, you know, that was the end of Dante's stay in the six stars, right? He was in his home, uh, his home stars of the, Gem the Gemini. And as you say, looking back, but, um, but in Canto 27, after Dante passed his comprehensive exams on, on, uh, on hope and uh, faith, hope and charity with flying colors, Peter, uh, St. Peter got very angry, right? And, and railed on Boniface at the beginning of 27. And at the end of 27, it was Beatrice, I think, right? Who was kind of uh, railing on the, and, and I think this connects to today. She railed on sort of how the world was so disordered. The universe was kind of out of sync, disordered in part because there was no king, no earthly ruler. The, the, the very big theme of Dante of the balance of powers that's not there. And so uh, in many ways, I think a lot of us are dealing with this uh, uh, epidemic, multiple, I guess, pandemics. Uh, of, and the uh, anger uh, at the powers yeah. that be, you know, both, you know, it, on all levels uh, of the yeah. powers that be and, and, and order and disorder. And, yeah. and one of the contrasts that's neat actually between 27 and 28 is the anger of 27 and the laughter and play mm. of 28 as we're gonna see there are numerous occasions of smiles and laughters and blushing and, yeah. and joy. So that's a big transition as well. That, that's, that's a great point. You know, and so uh, you know, one of the things I wanna say before we get into some more specific detail is at least from my perspective, I mean, I think the angels uh, are underrated. I think they, they, deserve, they deserve some little more love here because uh, you, know, you and I are dealing with this more, I guess you know, most people, we don't feel it perhaps, but I think most people would say this is a more abstract canto, right? Because you know you have Dante and Beatrice, but you don't have any other characters really. You have refer references to Gregory and some people, but you know Dante's not having a conversation with Peter as he was before, and so it's more the abstraction. It's the the abstraction of the math and the and the philosophy yeah. that, that you and I love so much. But the uh, paradoxes, but right? Paradoxes, yeah. exactly. But so I think we want to give the angels a little bit of a shout out here. You know, I always ask my students uh, at some point. You know, what are their associations with angels? And you know how do they connect with Dante? And of course, they come up with uh, TV shows and ways in which you have these more anthropomorphized angels. I guess I guess we would say like the guardian angel figure, right? Who's kind of uh, intervening. And I'm thinking of uh, what's it, Clarence from It's a It's a Wonderful Life, very famous mm -hmm. movie. Clarence you know, has to earn his wings and things like that. And they, and they know those stories, but they often connect even with this abstract version that Dante uh, gives us, because even for Dante, they are the intermediaries, right? Uh, and, and the prima mobile, the sphere that we're in, this outermost sphere, which is what the first mover, or the first moving sphere, right. giving motion to the other spheres, is the origin of time and generation. Uh, the next canto will get the creation stories, but you know, but in, in many ways, Dante is sort of uh, in sync a little bit, even with our more modern anthropomorphized idea in mm -hmm. terms of the connections between sort of the spiritual and the and the physical. Uh, natural worlds that, that that we're in here. So um, yeah, were there any- When you're mentioning the angels, I was just thinking of the, the recently released um, TV series, Good Omens, where there's angel and devil that uh, end up collaborating in really interesting ways. Uh, very yeah. not orthodox, but, but, but fun as well. And yeah. um, one of the things I also have always found fascinating is, is to try to imagine what the transparent, um, spheres sort of looked like, like Russian dolls, you know, the earth at the center and then the sphere of the moon somehow invisible, but, but going around the earth and the next one around that, all the way up to this, this almost onion skin level that is mm. prima mobile. It's not the starry sphere. Starry sphere is a material sphere. The prima mobile right. is some, it's like an energy force field. It's right. a thing that is connected, as we'll find out, to the seraphim, the highest right. order of angels, closest right. to God, that's giving all this power to it, that it then transmits down 
to the rest of the material spheres who are also getting power from their order of angels up in God. But there's there's two levels of energy transference happening, it seems to me, in Dante's cosmos. But anyway. We're, get, we're getting into the we're science. We're getting into it already, yes. No, but, yeah. that, but that's great. But you know, the, but the paradox idea is really wonderful. And in fact, I wanted to hear what you had to say because I always you know, try to press upon the students when we get to this point that in many ways here we're seeing sort of the inversion theme we'll talk about in a second. Things are not the way they appear to be or, or the reality and the appearances are not, not in sync. And Dante, the character is struggling to sort of grasp that. That's sort of a central issue uh, with this uh, canto, but it's a theme that runs through the entire Paradiso in a way, right? Because Dante's creating a world that by definition is beyond representation, and yet he still has to sort of give us something to sort of well, hang on. If I want to jump in, I mean, I can't resist because what you've said is, is actually one of the things that I'm focusing on in my research right now okay. is how Dante, in a, trying to explain the inexplicable and beyond representation of paradise, turns to the natural world, mm -hmm. turns to, in this canto very much so, but also in others, atmospheric phenomena, meteorological phenomena, things that are extraordinary in the natural world. Um, a bubble, a raindrop, um, as we'll see halos and coronae, very mm -hmm. nice uh, coronas, mm -hmm. we'll talk about soon, rainbows and obviously stars. And so what do you turn to for a model of something that is beyond representation? And right. so my interest again in science, which we have this background in, is, is figuring out what he looked at, thinking about what he looked at um, okay. in the world uh, of the material world to then use as some sort of analogy as a step towards understanding mm -hmm. the un understandable. In a sense. And, and at the same time, to, to touch on another theme that I think we're both interested in is he has to obviously invent words, right? He has to yes. invent the language to describe this. And so you mentioned Beatrice and right at the start, right? After yeah. she's speaking, uh, he, I think this is a neologism, right? Where he says, she is quella que paradisa la mia mente, in paradises, right? That beautiful. Word, right? Beautiful word, so. Makes it into uh, a verb. Like you were meant, when we were chatting earlier, obviously the transhumanar, right? right. To go beyond the human. Um, here is a kind of in paradise thing, um, bringing into the space that is paradise. And there are a bunch of neologisms in this canto, which are, are quite fun because they're reflexives. Right. And there, there are these verbs like sin vera, in truth, sin mila, mm. in thousands, sin terna, <laughs> en threes, becomes three or threes itself. Um, right. And there are others as well uh, that are fascinating too. But but this this idea of creating language, like you said, to try to represent um, the unrepresentable is is really striking. In this Do you connect the reflex the reflexive verbs with reflection in terms of the light? Is that what you think in terms of the mirror? I, I've wondered about that. I've not actually done deep thought uh, or research on it, but he definitely in his neologisms in general throughout the comedia um, uses the reflexive and, and makes things that are nouns, verbs, through right. the reflexive. And, and I, I like the image of, of activating a substantive of, of a noun and, and making it do something. Right. So he needs it to do something. So right. what do you think about that? What are your thoughts about reflection? Yeah, no, I think, again, it goes back to the beginning of the Paradiso too, because you know, obviously we're starting in 28, you know, he goes right to this mirror image because he's going to perceive that these, uh, these, these fiery angelic rings are wheeling around this infinitesimally bright, small uh, point through Beatrice's eyes, right? He's going to see it first reflected in her eyes, and then he's going to look behind him and see that it's really happening. And of course, that's what happens at the beginning of the poem, or beginning of the Paradiso early, I guess, Canto three, I think, right? When he's uh, looking at the spheres, the lunar spheres, and he thinks that they're uh, reflections. He sees these like very faint images in front of him, and he and he looks behind him, and it's another one of one of those funny moments. It says "haha" moments because, in fact, they're not behind him. They are those faint images that he thought were reflections uh, in a mirror. Um, so it shows you both the continuity of this theme of reflection and mirroring, you know, from the beginning of the Paradiso to the end, but also the change because now he is seeing things truly. They are really and correctly. And right. correctly. So, I mean, we've got this, this concept of reflection and mediation. I mean, this is what angels do. And angels are like mirrors reflecting God. Right. So if Dante at the beginning of this canto is looking at Beatrice, mm -hmm. um, 
and looking into her eyes and seeing the God point surrounded by nine circles of whirling angels. I've always thought that looks like an eyeball, a pupil uh -huh. and the iris sort of in, in a strange psychedelic way, you know, kind of like a, like a pinwheel uh, image. But um, he's looking at a reflection of God through her eyes and the angels through her eyes. But if what, if the angels are mirroring God, then it's a reflection of a reflection. Right. And to me, that's very interesting because he, when he describes this moment that you mentioned that happens also earlier in, in the Paradiso, he uses the term of a dopiero, which mm. is two candles wound together, a torch, a, a brighter kind of candle because it's two wicks. Mm. And, and this idea of doubling. So right. reflection is a doubling, but right. also this increase of doubling you see throughout this canto. And in a sense, what you, we will be talking about is the esemplo and the esemplare, the mm. original God space and that organization, and then the material spheres and that organization. Right. So there's this doubling that's going to happen throughout right. this canto of transition. Right. You know, I, I'm jumping ahead a little bit and we'll go back for a second, but you mentioned the doubling and I know we both wanted to say something about this, uh, the doubling, the numbering. And so the numbers of angels at the end of the canto and he uses the chessboard. How does the doubling work there? It's, it's 64 squares, right? It's on the chess 64 board. squares. And, and I, I've been fascinated by this. So just, uh, I wrote a few notes to remind myself that <laughs> um, in the convivio, Dante has a lot to say about how we should think of the number of angels. And he basically concludes that they're almost numberless. In Daniel, um, it's thousands upon thousands. Mm -hmm. Aquinas says they transcend all corporal reality. Um, so we've got not an infinite number, but almost. Um, the doubling of the chessboard goes back to this wonderful legend of the inventor of the chessboard, uh, of chess, sorry, of chess. Um, his king, uh, emperor, ruler, um, says to him, we are so pleased, I'm so pleased with this, anything you want as a gift. Uh, and he says, the inventor says, well, maybe just a grain of rice on the first square of the 64 squares and then double that through all the squares. Right. Now, it seems like a simple request, but unbelievably fast, exponentially mm -hmm. rose into, and I wrote this down, two, well, it's two to the 63 grains of rice. Right on the last square, but that's just the last square. Then you have to add in all the other squares that the rice has been doubled. So, so one, two, four, eight, and then it goes to this huge number, which is nine vigintillion, <laughs> as large as Mount Everest, or 2,000 million train wagons full. So that's right. how immense <laughs> this is. And the end of the legend is that the emperor, king, whatever, had him executed for <laughs> <laughs> making this choice. But, um, yeah, no, and I remember because I did the math at some point too, yeah. and, I, and I, the number is, is is a word I didn't even know, you know, how yeah. to say, and so it's just beyond 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 measure, as you say. So that's a great example, though, of Dante. And that's where one of the uh, neologism comes in, simila, that the uh, angels enthousand themselves, that they're right, just right, right, so many of them. So you know, I, I just want to make sure we don't uh, get, don't skip it over too much. But you know, we said that there's this inverse relationship, and so you know, the way it works, right, is that the innermost ring of angels, the fiery ring, the one that's that's moving uh, fastest and and is, is brightest, is is the smallest ring, um, but it's corresponding to the largest physical uh, sphere, which is the prima mobile, obviously. So one, if we say one is the innermost ring of angels, corresponds to nine. If nine is the outermost sphere. And then two, which would be the cherubim, the seraphim being the first ring, the cherubim being the second, uh, corresponds to the eighth or the next one in from the physical universe. And then, of course, three to seven, four to six. And I guess the only one that you don't have any sort of discrepancy with is five right, in the middle, which is Mars. Um, and so, uh, you know, Dante has to ask and Beatrice has to explain, you know, como l'esemplo e l'esemplare non vanno di un modo, right? How the uh, pattern and the uh, copy don't go or don't proceed in the same order. And of course, it's not a paradox if you think of it in terms of just the power, the innermost ring of angels is the most powerful um, in terms of the brightness and closest to God. And the outermost sphere is the most powerful, the swiftest moving sphere. And the closest to God. And the closest to God. <laughs> yeah. So there's the paradox, right? There's yeah. the wonderful uh, paradox. But the inversion of size is Dante's yeah. problem. He's like, right. wait a second. Wait a right. second, how is it that the, the biggest ring is the most powerful in the material realm and the smallest ring is the most powerful 
in the celestial realm, I thought size mattered. I right. thought, you know, <laughs> bigger is better. Now, as someone who's five feet tall, I'm extremely happy with this point because Beatrice <laughs> explains that it has to do with the virtues of love and grace and mm. the energy that uh, the intelligences, the angels have um, that increases their speed and their brightness. It's right. not about size. You right. know? So, so this is a, a paradox that, you know, Dante has to think about. And one of the ways I like to think about it is sort of a twist in the fabric of the cosmos. Right from the small to the large and the large to the small um, right. between these two um, similar but not identical realms. Right, right. Don't you find it amazing how often uh, more contemporary, more, you know, more recent images of science, uh, understandings of chaos and complexity and things like that seem to correspond maybe more easily? I, I don't want to say that we have an easier time understanding Dante today than somebody would I wonder. Years ago. But I wonder, I mean, in some ways, uh, because of his imagination, uh, it's, these no, ideas. this is exactly right. I mean, it, it's just fascinating to, to think that what he describes is mm -hmm. basically what mathematicians today would call a hypersphere or right. a three sphere. Here we have an ambulance. Right. <laughs> Hopefully, nothing too serious, but there right. it is. Um, right. So, mathematically, he, it wasn't that he was anticipating non Euclidean geometry, mm -hmm. it was that he was trying to match mm -hmm. Christian dogma mm -hmm. and um, certain kinds of aesthetic symmetries and patterns that he wanted the universe to be beautiful and, and yeah. symmetrical in, in, in these kinds of ways. So he had all kinds of things he was trying to reconcile, but it wasn't trying to be a mathematician to, to develop a new kind of math. But I mean, I see now we're already out of time and we haven't discussed yeah. so many things. Like the no, but let's, the, the corona, right? So the circles, the corona, but let's, yes. should we say something perhaps just about the play? We mentioned the chessboard, the game, but, um, and he mentions the, uh, the Angelici Ludi, right? The, 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 the angels who are sort of playing. Um, but what's the other, I guess it's the order that's, that causes a little bit of a, of a, of a smile, right? Or, There's a smile, right? So the, the ridere, um, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of fun that, um, we have Greg Gregorio who smiles when he realizes when he gets to heaven that the order of angels he he laid out in the uh, Magna Moralia wasn't exact. Um, Pseudo Dionysus got it right. He didn't get it right. Dante might not have known that that Gregory actually redid uh, mm. his order in a later work. Um, so there's a, a smile there, and then the sky smiles oh, when Dante okay. understands Beatrice's explanation of the paradox between the small and the large, and the inner and the outer, and also the brighter and the less bright. And so the, the sky smiles, so the angels smile, essentially. Right. Right. And, and just quickly, I know we have to finish, but I did want to mention this is research I'm working on now. I've been fascinated by how Dante describes the nine orders of angels expanding out from the God point. It's the first time he sees God in this canto as a point of light so tiny, a star would seem like a moon massive next to it. First inner circle is a bright red. And we know, we find out these are the seraphim and they love God the most. They're the closest to God's centripetal, for, uh, centripetal force. No, centripetal force. I was getting right. stuff. Uh -huh. Bringing into the center. What I've been thinking about, Dante uses the word alo, a halo. Mm. And he right. says it's kind of like a halo. And, and a halo, um, so the, the actual, sorry, the actual lines, I should memorize these, um, but we don't have time right now. He, he talks about the halo, and A-L-O, A-L-O, is a Latinism that's very rarely used in, in Dante's time. And a, an atmospheric halo is something that you see around a, a light source, so the sun or the moon, um, during a kind of, uh, in, in, in the halo case, a, um, it, it's when light ref, uh, refracts off of hexagonal columnar ice crystals um, in the atmosphere. And the rings are really distant from the light, mm. really distant and faint and very few. Mm. A corona, which is a similar phenomenon, but it happens differently. So the corona happens when light is diffracted by mm. water droplets or mm. ice crystals um, off of a cloud or fog or mist. And the circles around the light source, the sun or the moon or some other light source are much closer in mm -hmm. to the light source and you see a bright red. 
Ah. You see it bright red and many colors. Oh, okay. So in my mind, Dante was had seen both halos and coronas in the natural world and fused a little bit of each, fused them to create something more symmetric and more in line with uh, the kind of order that he wanted to create of the angels. And by, by angel order seven, um, he says it's bigger than a rainbow that we would see in the sky. So he's trying to use, again, the natural world to give us a sense, an analogy of, of, of what he's seeing. So I just thought it was interesting to mention this word corona and Dante does use the word corona in other contexts, right. uses it in Paradise 10 to talk about the um, the saints uh, in, the, in their circle and he does refer again to fog and an atmospheric condition. So the word corona comes later scientifically, right. Aristotle does not mention it in his time, there's no distinction between a halo and a corona as there is now, but I think it's it's a fascinating question to, to and because it helps us envision what did the pilgrim see? What did the poet want to write about? How close were the seraphim really to the God point? Well, I think we need to end on such a good hopeful <laughs> note, a nice image of Corona as opposed to that spiky little cell. And so that, exactly. I, thank, you, I thank you for that. That's really, 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 really nice. And, and, and of course I know uh, the, the colleagues, our colleagues who will talk about Canto 29, will get to talk more about angels, right? So hopefully they'll be able to pick up on some of the things we didn't have time to discuss today. And thank you so much, Guy. It's always such a pleasure to chat with you. I'm sorry I got a little carried away by the ah, atmospheric phenomenon. I love um, it. But, you know, it's, it's just an honor and a great joy to be able to talk with you about thank this. Thank you. Concept. Same here, Ari. Talk to you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye.